follow you. Thank you, God. Yes. Forward. Amen. Yes. How many of you want to follow God forward? Yes. Amen. Amen. But, but, but what about, okay, everybody says amen, but what about when things get rough? Ooh, yes. What about the times when it's not easy yes. to follow him forward? Then what do you do? You keep on following them. Yeah. You keep on following them. And the, and the thing about life and the older you get, you realize it's not always easy. All right. It's not, it's not always easy to follow because when you follow somebody, you have to trust that they know where they're going. <laughs> That's a big issue with it because you really got to trust that they know where they're going and they're going to take you to the right place and not, you know, lead you astray. But the thing is that we have a good father. Yes, thank you, God. And we have a good father that yeah. we can follow forward. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. As we just go ahead and bow our heads. Father God, Lord, we we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God. We just want to take this time to thank you. Thank first and foremost, Lord, you, God. for what you have done in our lives, God. For thank being God. in our lives. For being a part of our lives, yeah. God. And God. through any trial and any situation, any tribulation, God, you are there. And you're saying, follow me. Follow me. You're, you're lost and you're confused. Follow me. You don't know what direction to go. Follow me. You may even be blind. Take my hand and follow me. God, we thank you for that. God. We thank you for having a father that we can't follow. We may have a physical father that we cannot follow, God. But we have a spiritual father that we can follow. And we thank you, Lord. And we thank you now, Lord, for just being with us, Lord. Strengthen us, God. Strengthen us as a church family. Strengthen us as individuals, God. As as we allow people to follow us. Because you said, you know, they follow us as we follow Christ. So we have to be in the right place so people can follow us. Amen. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing. We ask that you bless the word of the Lord. Bless those who are listening, Lord, through Facebook, YouTube, and even those here in the sanctuary. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You can be seated. We uh, want to take the time to thank God for being here and thank God for everything that he's doing in our lives. Um, thank God for our pastors, James and Alice Hicks. Um, and we thank God for our special guest that's that's here. Those uh, may not be able to see him, but we have Mayor Nelson that's in the house. Mayor Amen. of uh, Apollo. Thank you for being here, Mayor Nelson. Very much a privilege and an honor to have you here. So, I do not want to prolong the time. We're going to be coming. Um, we've been in First Samuel for a long time. This is our last time here. This is a as I'm wrapping up the wilderness experience, the series that I've been on probably a month and change, maybe going on two months. Uh, we're coming from 1 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, as we wrap up this series. Let me wrap this series up. Um, and, you know, talking about the wilderness experience um, with David being in the wilderness, running from Saul. And I was correlating it to the wilderness experience that we all deal with from time to time and wilderness experiences that we go through. And... The thing about a wilderness experience is we don't know how long it's going to last. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes just when you think that it's coming to an end, it extends itself. <laughs> and you realize maybe I got to be in the wilderness a little longer than I initially thought. And the wilderness could be anything. You know, for David, it was the actual wilderness. Your wilderness experience could be dealing with um, a wayward child. That, that, that won't come in line. Dealing with a marriage that's broken and you're steadily trying to fix it and it's just taking longer and longer to fix it. Um, dealing with a business that just won't get off the ground. And you, you tried this, you put more money into it, you did more marketing and all this kind of stuff and it's just not working. Your wilderness experience can be anything like that. But we're talking about how David used specific things to get out of the wilderness experience and to deal with this wilderness experience. One thing we talked about was the well, first thing was the dream team. Talk about getting your team together, having the right people around you. That's very, very important. Then I did a, a message uh, yet again. Sometimes we get confused. We have to go back to God yet again. We have to continue to pray yet again. We have to continue to try yet again. And then I did a message called Strengthen Thy Hand. Okay, having the right people around you that can strengthen you and you being the type of person that can strengthen somebody else, having those people around you. And today, as I conclude this series about the wilderness experience, we're going to talk about almost, but not yet. Almost. 
but not yet. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Almost, but not yet. First Samuel, the 23rd chapter. Now I'm just going to read a couple of verses. From starting at 24, go down to 26. 24 says, And they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshima. Saul also and his men went to seek him, and they told David. Wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. 26. And Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. For Saul and his men come past David and his men round about to take them. May God add a blessing to the reading of the word. Amen. Like I said, I, I don't plan to be before you long. I want to get right to the meat of the subject of what I want to talk about, and we will move on with the service. The wilderness experience. David is still in the wilderness. This is after I spoke about how him and Jonathan connected. Jonathan encouraged him. And after that encouragement, it seems like things are getting worse. Saul's on his heels. And Saul was right there on him. And in verse 26, it says, And Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men, are on that side of the mountain. That's how close Saul is to him. He's right there on the same mountain. The exact same mountain. Saul's on one side. David's on the other side. All it takes is for Saul to cross over. And they will collide. Have you ever had your past on one side of the mountain? And your future on the other side of the mountain? Have you ever had your trial, your tribulation, your circumstance on one side of the mountain? But then your victory and triumph on the other side of the mountain. Amen. Let's bring it closer to home. Have you ever had the job that you hate going to and you've been there way too long and you don't like the boss? You don't like the coworkers on one side of the mountain. But then your dream job, the job that you really wanted, the job that you always wanted, on the other side of the mountain. The main issue is, and the one thing that is correlates all of this is the mountain. The mountain's in the middle. And just in case you can't relate to any of those, have you ever had your swimsuit, bathing suit, weight goal? On one side of the mountain, <laughs> and then your mom's caramel crusted pecan pie with ice cream on the top, warmed up in the microwave, just sitting right there on the other side of the mountain. The funny thing is, in that situation, it seems like the mountain don't seem as big. It seems a lot easier to reach the pecan pie than it is. I don't know. Maybe that's me. I'm sorry. I'm speaking to myself. I'm sorry. I apologize. I apologize. The point of the matter is, a lot of times it seems like there's a mountain in between what you want and where you're trying to go. But it also seems that your past or your struggles or your triumph is on that other side of the mountain trying to catch you and trying to overtake you so that you won't reach the ultimate goal that God has for you. That is the situation that David finds himself in is because he is running from Saul and Saul is right there on that other side of the mountain because the mountain is in between. But the thing I like about David is even though David knew that he was close, I know Saul's close, I know he's right around the corner, David didn't stop running. All right. He didn't stop running, he didn't stop trying, he didn't stop, he kept going, he kept going, he kept going, he said, I'm not going to give in. And I think a lot of times we, we give in too quick and we uh, allow the issues, we think more about the issues and the circumstances, and we allow that to overtake us when we have to keep moving. We have to keep moving, we have to keep moving, we have to keep moving, and not allow those things to undertake us. We cannot get in, okay. amen? But like I said, sometimes getting to where you wanna go, it seems so far away. It seems it's this big mountain in middle, how am I gonna get over there? Is it even worth trying? Yes, it is. 
Yes, it is. It's, it's worth trying. Because as big as that mountain is, you know, if you think of, of real mountains, you know, you look, oh man, that's a real high mountain. Somebody has climbed that mountain before. Amen. Actually, nine times out of ten, multiple people have climbed that mountain before. So if they can do it, why can't you do it? Amen. Let's not let the mountain cause us to, to go back to the past side. Like, uh, you know what, I, there's no reason I can get on the other side of that mountain, so I'm just going to stick to this path. I'm going to stick over here where it hurts, over here where the trials are, over here where there's pain, instead of going to where the victory is. And a lot of times we stay in confusing situations, we stay in frustrating situations because we're scared to scale the mountain. Mm -hmm. Let's not be scared to scale the mountain. Even during our wilderness situation, even when things are dry and it just doesn't look good, and you, even, you may not even feel like you have the strength to do it. You gotta keep moving. You gotta keep moving. You gotta keep moving. Just take one step and then take another step. You don't have to move as fast as everybody else. We get caught up thinking, I gotta move. You know, you see social media, social media makes you think that everybody's doing good fast. <laughs> <laughs> they were poor yesterday and now they're driving a Mercedes the next day. Like, oh my God, why am I not moving that fast? No, that's not how life really, really works. Sometimes you have to take your time and, and, and take step by step by step, but you just keep moving. Amen? Amen? That's what David had to do. He had to keep moving. So now also in verse 26 it says, And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. And Saul and his men come past David and his men round about to take him. They had had David cornered now. They said they come past him. That means now, now that now they're all around about him. Now they, they have him in their sights. Because the idea is, hey, we get around him, and then we can slowly come in and just pick them off one by one until we get to David. That's the idea. And they were right there. And it looked like I would even see as David starts to notice and say, oh man, they're, oh, they're getting close. They're getting close. He starts to think that his past is caught up with him. And, and maybe maybe this is the end. Maybe the show is about to be over. And have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like the walls are caving in? It's too much. It's getting it's getting close. Like I'm I'm, I'm behind on my bills, and, and I know they're getting ready to come and take the car, and I know that you know they you know eventually they're gonna shut off the lights and stuff. It's like it's caving in. It's getting really really tight. Have any of you guys ever been there before? It seems like the devil has you cornered, and he's coming in for the kill. Maybe it's a sickness or something. You know, we got we're still in a pandemic right now. We're still in a pandemic, and it and sometimes it seems like it's getting closer and closer and closer. Some of us might have even had had COVID, and we even know people who've had COVID, even know people who passed away from COVID. But it seems like it's just so close, and it makes you nervous. It makes you scared. It says here that he was in fear of Saul. He was in fear of Saul because he knew he was getting close. Have you ever been there? And, and when the walls are caving in, but God gave me a simple thought to let you know that almost, but not yet. Almost, but not yet. What that means is that even though it seems like it's almost about to take you, it's almost about to take advantage of you, it's almost about to, to capture you and, and entangle you in something, God says, not yet. The situation can say, we got you. It's, it's over. It's a wrap. There's nothing you can do. But is that what God said? See, we have to make sure that we're hearing the right voice. Because if we sit around and we're just hearing the voice of the situation, then we're going to be defeated. Because the situation is always going to tell you, got you. We have nowhere else to go. You're trapped. We have you uh, surrounded, come past about. You have nowhere to move. No other moves. Kind of like, I don't know if you guys play chess, or anybody plays chess, you know, you get to that checkmate. Checkmate means the king has no other move. Anywhere the king moves, he's gone. And your situation will always scream checkmate. But this is the thing. In chess, you know, you have checkmate, it's really checkmate. In life, it's not really checkmate. That's not really the case, all right? It just tells you that and it scares you so you give up. <laughs> I remember playing, um, not chess, but actually playing checkers with a guy. And once he, he never would finish the whole game. If he got to a point where he felt like he was going to lose, he, he just quit. He just wiped the board. Okay, you win. And I thought that was weird because from my view, he might have had a few other spaces to possibly win. All it takes is for me to make one mistake. And you're back in the game. 
but he didn't even want to wait to see if I made a mistake. He just assumed I lost. How many people live their life that way? I just assumed that I lost. This is, this is how I'm supposed to be. This is how life's supposed to be. I'm supposed to be broke. My mom's been broke. We all lived in poverty. We all, that's just how it's supposed to be. So I lost. Why, why continue to try? You know, um, I'm, I'm supposed to have a dead end job. I, you know, I've always had a dead end job. Why, why even try to get a promotion? Why even look for another job? Why even go through that that struggle? I've always, I've, I've always uh, had a messed up marriage. The marriage has been been messed up from the beginning. It's just what it is. I just live with it because you know it has me surrounded, and there's no, I have no other move. But that's when you're listening to that voice. When you listen to the voice of God. He has so many areas of opportunity, is what we like to call it in my industry. So many areas of opportunity to get you in a better space. And these are ways that you never thought of. Never thought of. I always like to say, you know, God can get you out of your situation in 50 million different ways. And we usually, in our mind, only think of maybe three. That's why we get stuck, because all I can think of three. All right, uh, if I don't have no money, either somebody can give me the money, I can win the lotto, or I can find money on the street. Those are the only options we think of, right? Because like this, you know how many different ways I can put money in your hand outside of those ways that don't even make sense? There's so many ways he can bless you. So many ways that he can bless you. Now, let me give you some, some reasons why we tend to think that way. One reason is we give up too quick. I already talked about that a little bit. We give up too quick. Like I said, in the giving you the same scenario as the chess and the checkers, we see that we've lost. So we give up. All right. No reason to keep trying. And what bothers that person is they give up, but then they see people around them that don't give up and then start to see them continue to progress. How do you think that person feels? Now that I'm seeing other people progress, but they didn't give up. They kept the faith. They, they continue to push through, and finally their victory comes, and they're the ones standing back like, oh, man. I was having a conversation with a friend uh, not too long ago, and they were, you know, really dealing with um, struggles. They kept, they've been keep trying to do certain things. They keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, and it just hasn't worked out, and they're almost getting to the point, you know what? I can't do it. I'm, I'm giving up. This is, I've tried so many times. It's just not working. I think I'm going to give up. And I, uh, I gave him a, a scenario. I said, you know what? If you uh, start a successful business, and let's say you know you went to college and everything, and you have you graduated with a, a C average from college, you graduated C average from college, you get a successful business and you're grabbing clientele. Is anybody going to come and ask you what grade average you had when you graduated college? I've never been asked that. An interview or anything like nobody's ever asked that. All they want to know is, do you have a degree? And can you do what I need you to do? Are you qualified to do it? If I know that you can do that, the rest really doesn't matter. Uh, from, let's say from a lawyer standpoint, let's say a lawyer you know takes the bar. Say they it took them eight times to pass the bar, but they finally pass it. Once they start their practice or they work for another law firm, whatever they decide to do, is anybody going to ask them how many times it took them to pass the bar? Does anybody really care? No. The idea is that you pass the bar. You have the, you, you have the license that's needed to do the job that I need you to do. That's all that matters. I say that to say a lot of times we give up too quick because we don't want to continue to push on. If we continue to push on, all of the stuff that we went through is not going to matter. All that matters is that you got there, is that you got to that space. Most people that I know that are successful have failed way more times than they have succeeded. Way more times. I'm sure if we ask Bear Nelson about, about you know his past and everything, I'm sure he can tell you a whole lot of times that he's failed. But what I noticed that when you do win, you win big. <laughs> and that's what people remember. They remember the big wins. They don't remember the small losses. They remember the big wins. That's why we cannot be quick to give up. Because we don't know what's on the other side of the mountain. We don't know. We're, we're, we're stuck on the one side when there's a whole other side of opportunity, whole different doors that are open that's waiting for us. Amen? Amen. Now, I said sometimes we give up too quick. Sometimes we move too quick. 
we gotta give up. But now we, we're moving too fast. All right. So so we we hear of an issue that's going on and oh let me hurt it and fix it. And you start, you know, just scrambling and doing this and doing that. Sometimes you can make situations worse. Instead of taking the time, let me let me pray. Let me pray first. And let me see if God can guide me to the right person that can give me the insight, give me the information I need in order to be successful, in order to get past this trial and tribulation that I'm dealing with. But no, we're quick to move so fast because we want to fix the problem and we're nervous and, and we feel like we have to have all the answers. No, a lot of times moving too fast helps make you fumble the ball. You can take your time. All right. Pray to God. I, I work in sales and in sales, the main thing is you want people to make a quick decision. Because you want the sale as fast as possible. <laughs> you want people to make a quick decision. But me, me being on the other side, when I go someplace and somebody's selling me, I never, I never make a decision on the spot unless it's something small or I already know what I'm going to get when I get there. But if it's a, a real decision, I never make the decision on the spot. I always go back, think about it. Oh, you're going to miss out on a great deal because it's only today. Okay? Then I'll go to your competitor and they'll give me the great deal. That's fine. <laughs> If you don't give it to me, the guy down the street will give it to me. All right, no problem. No, no big deal. So we have to make sure that we're not um, giving up too quick, but then we're not moving too quick. Because like I said, the message is almost, but not yet. It's not over yet. All right. So don't move too fast. Don't give up too fast, but don't move too fast. Amen? Amen. And the last thing that is one of the issues that we deal with is we forget as Christians, whose we are. We forget whose we are. We are Christians. We are the children of the Almighty God. Like I said earlier, there are so many ways that he can fix your situation. So many ways he can fix the situation. But once again, you only see three, three options. When he has 50 million of them lined up, we have to remember whose we are. The Almighty God can do anything at any given time to fix your situation. And if you look through the Bible, a lot of times, a lot of times in the Bible, he waits until you're knee deep in the situation before he pulls you out. I'm talking about like right over the water's over your head. It's not up to your nose. It's over your head. You're drowning. And then he's like, oh, okay, all right, I'm going to pull you out. Right. Let's think about it. Daniel and the lion's den. In a situation like that, when I think about Daniel the lion's den, you know, Daniel was a praying man. That's what got him in trouble in the first place. He prayed and he, he wasn't going to stop praying. And in my head, you think, all right, God's going to come through for me. I think he had faith. He knew, I know he has faith. God's going to come through for me. But I'm pretty sure he was thinking God would come through before they threw him in. Because I'm thinking, you know, the closer they're walking them, walking them, walking them, okay. They didn't mind any time now. Anytime. Anytime you send some angels, that's fine. You can send some people to run out. Yeah, that's fine. You can you know, make these guys drop dead so I can run away. I don't care what you do. We're good. And then they, they get him up to there. He's looking over there. Oh, man. Wow. There's like eight lions in there. And they're just walking around. Okay. God, there's still time. And then they push him. He's like, all right, the angels go grab me before I hit the ground because there's no way he's going to let me get in here. He had to go in the den. He had to fall in there with the lion and stay what? Overnight. <laughs> Not like he had to stay five minutes. He had to stay there overnight. So even, even in my, I'm just thinking from a, a real life perspective, even if you get there and you see the lion cage, you know mine. And you're feeling comfortable. I mean, eventually they're going to want a midnight snack. <laughs> they're not going to eat each other. <laughs> I'm the only thing that looks different in here. <laughs> you remember they're going to get hungry. <laughs> What's going to happen then? <laughs> when God did not get him out of there, he had to stay there all night. Sometimes you have to be in the situation before he takes you out. I thought about when uh, we all heard about the, the story when Paul was shipwrecked. You know, the shipwreck story when he was on the ship, right? And, and, uh, and the storm and everything, and it's falling apart. And, you know, God could have put, put the ship back together or just let the ship make it. Ship didn't make it. God gave Paul a word and said, hey, everybody that stays on the ship, y'all going to make it. The ship's still going to be destroyed, but you better stay with the ship. Who, who, who wants to stay on a ship that's falling apart? <laughs> it makes no sense, right? 
But that was the wording. Everybody that stayed on the ship was able to grab them a piece and float on in. But my point of the matter is, is that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like God came and swooped in and took them all off the ship before it sank. They had to go through this. So you need to get to the point in, in your walk with Christ that I'm willing to go through. I'm willing to go through. And if that's what it takes to reach the other side of the mountain, Lord, I'm willing to go through. A lot of us, we, we, we're so scared that we don't, we don't want to go through nothing. Like, oh, Lord, no, 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 please, 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 I don't want to go. But God's like, no, your victory is on the other side, but you got to go through it. I mean, I, I may not allow you to walk around the mountain. You got to walk, walk through the mountain. If that's what the case is, we have to be willing to do that. Amen? Amen. Because the key is almost, but not yet. God is saying, that yeah, it's, it, it seems like it's close. It seems like it's coming around you. It seems like it's going to be a problem, but not yet. David's in this situation. They're they're you know compassed about him. Things is looking bad. He's the leader, and he's always so far been able to be a step ahead. So I've been able to catch him. He's been able to be a step ahead. Things have been good, but now, you know, what's that? Six hundred men. They're looking at him. Uh, 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 Commander David. What's the next move? Because I see, I see these guys, they're coming up here, they got, they got their little arrows, they got their this and their that, and it looks like they're about to come in. What are we going to do? I don't think David had the answer. At this point, he didn't have an answer. We just about to stand strong and try to fight and do what we have to do. But now let's see what happens in verse 27. But there came a messenger unto Saul. Now, whoa, whoa. Right in the middle. We got, we got this guy. He's right there. I see him. We're about to move in. There came a messenger unto Saul saying, Haste thee and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. What a coincidence. <laughs> what a coincidence. Who else? Who else can set up the chess pieces so that right when they are about to go in for the kill, their arch enemy, the Philistines, find the Philistines forever. Just happen to take advantage of the situation and say, ha, 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 ha. we're coming in now. You, you going after this one guy who hasn't done anything to you, and we just gonna take over your whole land while you sleeping. Look at that. Look how God got David out. <laughs> you think you think David had that in his mind that, oh yeah, that's how God's gonna get me out. He'll call the Philistines to attack the land, and then Saul's gonna have to leave. Something, something totally out the blue. Like I said, God has so many ways that He can protect us, and we don't we don't know half of them. This was just the way that God used to protect them. So it says, "For the Philistines have invaded the land. Not the Philistines are coming to invade. They're already there. <laughs> They've already invaded the land. So, so it's not like I have time. Like He said, well, uh, if they're coming, I may have uh, a couple hours. Let's go and get David, and then we'll head back. No, no, they're already there." They're already taking over stuff, killing people. We got to get back. And so 28 said, wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David. How mad was Saul? <laughs> How mad was this guy? How mad was he when he was like, right, I've been chasing this guy. I spent so much money, so much manpower. We, we got to sleep in the wilderness chasing him. Finally, he's right here. And now he has to make a decision. I can go. I can go after my target, and I can get them. But then the whole country falls apart. Or I can go save the country. And it says Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, they called that place. I'm not going to try to say that word. And David went up from thence and dwelt in strongholds at Engedi. God delivered David. But it seemed like it was right there on the line to where they, the, his enemy was really about to press in. But it was almost. But not yet. That is the message that I'm trying to portray to you today. Is that whatever your situation is, whatever hurt that you're dealing with that continues to afflict you, uh, whatever um, family issue that continues to be a problem, whatever financial issue that you're steadily going through and you just can't see a way out. God is saying almost. 
but not yet. What did we say earlier? You got to keep moving. You got to keep moving. You got to keep moving. Keep praying. You got to keep fasting. You got to keep seeking God. It seems like seems like it ain't working yet, but keep pushing. Keep pushing. David, at this point, seemed like it wasn't working. But God, last minute, I got you. That's where our faith comes in. Our faith has to come in that even if I fall in the lion's den, God still can protect me. Even if the whole ship sinks and I'm on it, he can still get me to land. Even if I'm already in the belly of the fish, God can still sustain me and cause me to live and not die. That is where our faith has to lie. That even in the situation, even after they have repoled the car, I'm pretty sure God can give me another one. You know, even after they foreclosed on the house, I, I, I think God has more than one house. We have to understand that our faith is crucial in these times and in these moments when we're dealing with stuff that we don't understand. Even when somebody passes away that we don't expect. We don't see it coming. It catches us off guard. Is God yet not faithful? Amen. He's still faithful. He's still faithful. He can heal that heart. He can heal that hurt. Will it take time? Of course. But God is there. And he will always be there. Okay. So all I want you to remember is. Almost. But not yet. And how do you know that that's the truth? Because you're all sitting here right now. <laughs> Obviously it ain't yet. <laughs> you're sitting here watching on, on Facebook live streaming. It ain't yet. It may be almost, but obviously, it's not yet. Amen? Amen. All right. If you stand, we'll do our prayer, and then we'll move on with the service. Almost, but not yet, as we wrap up this wilderness experience. <sighs> Father God, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God, Lord. Simple, simple message, a simple thought, but hopefully it penetrates the hearts of your people and it plants a seed in their heart to where they realize that regardless of the situation I'm going through you Lord have the final say God you have the final say it is not over until God says it's over so as long as I'm living as long as I'm breathing as long as I'm moving I still have a chance you are still on the throne and you can still make a way out of no way Lord, we thank you for the opportunities, God. We thank you for the doors that you are going to open, Lord. We thank you for the victory that's on the other side of the mountain, whether we have to walk around it, go over it, or drill our way through it. Yeah. We thank you, Lord, for we know the victory is on the other side. We just have to keep walking. We have to keep pushing. We have to keep moving to get to our place of victory. Lord, we thank you. We praise your name now. In Jesus' name, Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Um... Oh.